Hey there, everyone. Jason here. Let me double check on Facebook itself that we are live. So I know the one time I don't check is the one time that it won't work. It looks like there we are. Great to see. Yeah, good when a plan comes together. So hey there, I'm Jason Logston, and this is Exploring Sous Vide. We're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. And today's sponsor is the Champions of Sous Vide Community. It's run by the ISVA, of which I am a part. And there's two levels to the Champions of Sous Vide. There's a free side, which contains more than 100 recipes from our showcases, our conferences, and contributed by our members. And then you can also get a discount on the annual Sous Vide Summit, which is coming up in August, and any paid courses we run, as well as access to special demos and interviews we are involved in, such as the global international sous vide panel that we ran for International Sous Vide Day. Uh, there's a special invite to members of the community. And then we have a VIP section, which is only $5 a month. And in addition, you will get access to all of the videos from all the showcases and conferences. It's up to more than 30 hours of sous vide video content from names like Meathead, Chef James Grishione, Chef AJ Schaller, and dozens more, including today's guest. Um, you can check out all that at the isva.net slash champions. And remember, all these episodes are available as a podcast on your favorite podcast players, or you can join us live every Thursday when we record these episodes. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. So join us Thursdays at afmez.com slash show. So on to the show. Sous vide is often equated with high-end, gourmet, or scientific cooking, but that is mainly because it got its start in high-end restaurants and mass-produced food. And while sous vide does belong in Michelin star kitchens, some of its greatest strengths are for the home cook. And today's guest is the perfect person to show us why. She is the food blogger behind the Duck's Oven and the author of Everyday Sous Vide. It's all French to me. She was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, and has been food blogging for over 10 years. She spends most of her free time in the kitchen, and cooking became her stress outlet in college and remains that today. Instead of using it to tune out the pressure of schoolwork and a part-time job, it now serves as her way to unwind after work and her favorite creative outlet. I can't wait to learn from today's guest, Chelsea Cole, cookbook author and blogger at A Duck's Oven. Chelsea, welcome to Exploring Hi. Sous Vide. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on. It's great having you back here, and we got a lot of people joining us in the comments. If you're joining in, say hello. We have Darren Wilson from Firewater Cooking, we got mm -hmm. Saeed Ahmed from Katy, Texas, uh, Kevin Liddell. How's it going, Kev? Nice to see you. Mike Lashardi, Richard Jensen from Dallas, Fort Worth, Lisa Keys. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, it's one of my favorite shirts. I'm pretty sure my wife bought it for me, which is why it looks decent on me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we got Michael Bailey, a bunch of people joining us. So if you're in the comments, say hi, let us know you're there. Say hi to Chelsea and uh, put down any questions you have. I'll be sure to pass them along. So Chelsea, you are a repeat guest. You have been on this show before. You've been on my other podcast for food bloggers. So I'm going to dispense with the normal icebreaker question because you've already answered it for me. Um, so instead, I'm going to ask, what is it like around your kitchen in the mornings? Ooh, in the mornings. Okay, that's a really good question. So lately, I've been making sure to actually like clean the kitchen after dinner before bed. I, I have I'm been not, doing like, that too. For it's like a so week. much better. <laughs> yes, it's but it, like it it for some reason it's like a blockage for me. But when I do it, it's really good. And so then, like assuming I've done that, morning is unloading the dishwasher while I drink coffee. I am one of the um, weirdos who like I have a timed coffee machine, so I set that every night before bed. So when I wake up, it is done uh, because that is very helpful for me. <laughs> I'm with the dishwasher, get things tidy. And then uh, we usually don't eat till late. Um, like I well, might have like a small snack if I'm going to work out in the morning. But like my husband doesn't usually eat until like 1030. And then I usually eat at 930 or so. Um, so it's pretty quiet until mid morning. And then sous vide bites. <laughs> 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 nice. My, my wife's coffee timer is me that whenever I am up, I'm always up before her. So she always has coffee freshly made when she wakes up. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've normally gone through like half, half a pot by that time. So it's, you know, it's not completely selfless on my side, but <laughs> yep. I feel you on that. I actually use my husband wakes up later than me and uh, usually I'll bring him coffee to wake him up. So <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> what's your favorite egg bites flavor? Okay. So lately, well, I've been, uh, taking weightlifting more seriously. We kind of like outfitted our home gym. 
So I've been doing, um, which a lot of people might like balk at this, but I'm doing like half egg white and then half egg. Um, and then I usually add lately, I've been adding cottage cheese and sour cream and I use a blender just to kind of get the cottage cheese chunks a little smaller mm-hmm. and turkey bacon and goat cheese is kind of my jam lately, but I have other, I also really like to do, um, like, a lox and cream cheese variations, so just like little chunks of cream cheese and smoked salmon is super good. I see. Yeah, the first time I made it, I just like did a light kind of whisking stir together and that was it. And I was like, oh, this is like an egg omelet with chunks of cream cheese in it. it was Yep. Yeah. That was I would I've just like resorted to the blender, which can mean like some weird textural things if I don't get let it settle down long enough, but it's still the easiest. I like back-to-back guests that have been doing uh weightlifting more. We had uh Lloyd Capiccio on um last weekend and he's used to be a competitive power lifter. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh I've got I've got my dumbbells at home and that's not it. So <laughs> We were, just, we were discussing how many of the commenters at one time could Lloyd actually bench press. And it was two or three, depending on who they were. <laughs> That's a, a, People like that, like my husband um, is like a thin person, but he can bench press more than his body weight. And I'm like, it's just like so rude. I'm, I'm, I'll work towards that eventually, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk sous vide school. You just put out a new sous vide course. Um, I've gone through it. I appreciate the invite to that and the Porter Road certificate to uh, get some meat to check it out. I think my Porter Road's coming uh, tomorrow, <laughs> which I'm looking forward uh, to. Me too. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> I always love seeing different people's takes on sous vide because everyone approaches it so differently. You know, I've read uh, your take. I've read Thomas Keller's take, and they are super different, which I appreciate since you know my whole origin story is that I read Thomas Keller's and didn't know what he was talking about and tried to figure it out for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, So what, uh, can you tell us about what prompted you to make a sous vide course? Yeah. So I am clearly passionate about sous vide. And um, one of the great things about writing my cookbook about sous vide cooking a few years ago is it gave me so many opportunities um, to do community events. Portland is incredibly supportive of its culinary people. Um, In fact, I'm on the board of the Portland Culinary Alliance. And um, I had the opportunity to do tons of events like farmers markets, um, night markets. We do all kinds of like foodie type halls here and people would come up to me and I like as much as I love talking to people in person, I truly do. I would get asked at an event night, like a six hour event night, probably 50 times. What is sous vide? (laughs) And give the same answer over and over again. I got really, really, really well practiced at this. And then I would have people, I noticed um, another common group beyond the what is sous vide would be uh, so-and-so gave me an immersion circulator three years ago and it's still in the box. Or like I used it once, but I didn't really get it. And it feels too like gadgety for me. And lots of comments like that, or like I've been using it for steak, but I don't really know what else I should be doing with it. And so, and then there's the other extreme where there's people like all of us probably who understand its power and want to use it all the time. And so I really wanted to reach these other people who were familiar with the concept, but intimidated for one reason or another. And so the the way I approach this, it's called sous vide school, is um, to truly bring people into the fold, like have them learn about what sous vide cooking is, not write that part off while trying my best to make it as approachable as possible. Um, so they would actually do it. So part of the way I structured sous vide school is you learn a couple concepts and then you're asked to do a, what I call a lab. So you're asked to cook something immediately. So maybe you haven't learned everything yet, but you just got to try it and see the magic for yourself. Um, so that's largely why I did it because I just, I feel like sous vide can be a very empowering tool for home cooks and I want them to try it out for themselves. I love that approach to it. A lot of my earlier books were definitely like, let's dive into the the science and there's less of the science than like Thomas Keller or Douglas Baldwin went into, but it was still trying to explain that understanding. Then I would have recipes that kind of highlighted each one. And my more recent stuff that I've done, um, I have like a short free non-video <laughs> email uh, course, you know, for sous vide, um, the, the quick start. And it was based around like, let's get people cooking. Like when you you know, get a printer, or you get a new piece of technology, there's like the quick start guide. And it doesn't yeah. tell you everything you need to know about your camera, but it tells you like, this is how you get a picture to show up on it, you know? Yes. 
And it's that's that was my approach that I, that I think is a lot more effective in some ways that it's like, you know, here's how you do a chicken breast and it's super simple and easy. And then by the end of you know the seven emails I send out, it's like, okay, what time and temperature do you want? What do you like? You've understand stood some of this now. Um, how did you go about breaking it down into the various kind of digestible chunks? You know, where do you draw that line between this is an easy way to do a chicken breast and you kind of need to know some stuff to make decision, especially for like a chuck roast or short ribs. Yep. So I, my first, um, my first, by the way I kind of chose to start it, the first section is about demystifying the immersion circulator itself. Um, so like the first section is just literally what is sous vide. And the very first thing I teach you is how to pronounce it (laughs) because so many people I talk to say, you know, sous vide or sous vide, or I've heard lots of variations. So I'm like, okay, let's cover off on the pronunciation first things. (laughs) And then, um, then I, I go into literally how to use your immersion circulator. So like what buttons to push, what this means, just a few basic little things, and then you're asked to cook. So just understanding the gadget. And like, I even talk about why it's called an immersion circulator. It circulates the water. It's not just like a standalone heater in there. Um, and like, I think having those being able to create those visuals in your mind helps you understand the machine a lot better. And once you do understand the machine. It's like an instant pot. Once you understand that it's a pressure cooker, well, actually in that case, that's, I was going to say, it's not scary anymore, but for me, once I understood (laughs) it was a pressure cooker, it was very scary. So that's not quite true. Um, Sous vide machines might not be as popular, but they do explode less traditionally. (laughs) (laughs) Huge benefit to sous vide. Um, I know David Petransic's first time being electrified, electrocuted was with his homemade uh, sous vide circulator. Well, homemade. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) yeah, there was like 12, 12 years ago, I think, but it was yeah, Scott I'm not great enough for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then like in the next section, um, you know, once they've understood what the immersion circulator is and how to use it, we dive more into understanding time and temperature and um, kind of the science of all of that, which it, which is where it gets a little scary. So like I repeat in that section 8,000 times, don't overthink this, don't overthink this because um, I think, you know, one of the things I see in so many Facebook groups is debates over time and temperature. Um, And I, as much as there is, we were talking about this a little bit um, before we went live, but as much as there is like, um, you know, kind of a baseline, like something everybody would recommend for a specific cut, there is a lot of personal preference involved with it too. And so I try to empower, I try to empower the students in sous school to think about what they enjoy and how they can achieve what they enjoy with time and temperature. And so just really, it's more about empowerment with understanding the science rather than like, I don't know, making it scary. Like I try to think of it as like a high school science class almost. Um, and then again, they're asked to go to the lab and then et cetera. And so the first three sections are a lot about knowledge building. Um, so just understanding all the interesting things within sous vide. So the third section goes over like um, getting good flavor and searing and things like that. Um, but then the sections that I'm adding for the next few months, I'm adding a new section every two weeks, starting on Thursday of next week, um, are more, or will not be as like knowledge heavy because you have a good base. So our next one's going to be infusions. Um, and then after that, we're going to be talking about seafood and stuff like that. And there's going to be less explanation needed just because hopefully they have that good base from the beginning. Yeah. I feel like with temperatures, it's, people get in those arguments about, you know, should you do a steak? Like what's a medium or steak? Is it 132 or like 135? And it's like, who cares? Like it's just do one. You can't and adjust next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's like, you do need to know that like, if you take a chuck roast or something, if you cook it at 130, it's going to be a different final dish than if you cook it at 165 or even 150. Like those are three very distinct dishes that you're not going to confuse for each other. And if you're, if you want a, a pot roast and you cook it at 130 and follow, you know, time and temperatures for 130 for 36 hours, you're going to be extremely disappointed because you're going to get a, a really good steak and not a pot yes. roast. Exactly. Like that's actually, and that's one of the things it's so funny that we talk about um, an understanding time because um, one of the things I talk about is like, you can't overcook anything but you like kind of can (laughs) with, so the things I I encourage students to ask themselves are what is the texture that I want from this cook? 
um, what what is my timeline? Because some things are unsafe if you have them at um, a temperature under 130 degrees for too long. Like all these things to consider when deciding on your time and temp. Yeah, it is that um, traditionally, right? Overcooking your food means cooking it to a higher temperature than you want it. Like in almost all cases, that's what it means. And in sous vide, that's not the case. If you can't do that um, until you go to the searing step, but it's it just tenderizes the more you have it in there. And eventually, uh, depending on your type of food, it could be a half hour or it could be 12 hours, depending <laughs> what you're cooking, it starts going down and down. Yeah, actually, uh, one of the things I did, which this was like a really fun experiment for me, because I just hadn't, like I knew this in the abstract, abstract, but hadn't done a side by side, was I cooked three different steak or three steaks, all the same cut um, at 130 degrees, one for two hours, one for four hours and one for six hours. And then I just stacked them up and took a photo and you can see how different the texture is between each of them. So okay. although they're still all medium rare and, and pink and beautiful, like there is definitely a difference there. I did something similar for the presentation that I did at the, the last sous vide summit. It was on chuck roast. And so I did it at five different times and five different temperatures and measured the liquid that came out. And yeah. it is like the, the one hour, the two hour and the four hour, like most of the liquid loss happens during that time. And then you lose maybe 30% more over the next 36 hours of cooking. Like it all happens right away. Um, and then the temperature is huge differences in um, the amount of moisture loss and, you know, definitely the um, the structure of the meat. Like you, I put slices and the one's like, oh, it looks like a peak slice of steak. And the other one's just like separate individual parts of meat that is like scrunched together. It is yeah. fascinating to see. Oh, that's so cool. I, I that it's so interesting to me that, um, the majority of that liquid loss happened in that one time frame, and then after that, it kind of levels out. That's I think that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was really surprised because I was like, "Oh, well, you want to minimize the amount of time it's in the bath, and it's like up to like five or six hours. After that, it very barely matters. Yeah, it's it's really getting up to the temperature, um, and that changes the proteins of the meat. So you get up to the temperature, and that's where the moisture loss happens, and then the cooking time doesn't seem to do as much from from my extensive like two experiments I've done in my life, but. <laughs> but that makes sense. No, that totally makes sense. I think that's really fascinating. Um, Mike says he did a two and a half hour salmon and FYI, that does not work. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's okay. I want, I kind of want to do it just to see it. But on the other hand, I love my salmon. Uh, <laughs> Cause yeah. yeah, usually for salmon, I do like 45 minutes. Yeah. Oof. Kevin says he did swordfish that long too and came out complete mush. Oof, I believe it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My rule of thumb is always like you have like 30 to 50% variance kind of that if it's, you know, uh, salmon that you're generally going to cook for 40 minutes and you have like another 20 minutes you can kind of add on without too much of a noticeable loss in quality. And if it's a chuck roast that's you're going 36 hours, you have maybe another 10 to 18 hours before it really, you know, is too soft. I, that was actually one of the concepts I had the most trouble explaining because um, I, well, what I ended up doing is I created this like table that was like um, time ranges for different types of food. And it's, it's so hard to, to communicate this because it's like, but some things have a time range of one hour to two hours and some things have a time range of one hour to four hours. And just, you know, thinking about what you have more wiggle room for is, um, is a different, a difficult thing to explain and something that just gets intuitive with practice, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I always try to break it down into there's like tender foods that you would feel comfortable throwing on a grill and yep. those you just need to heat, heat through. And then there's things that you need to tenderize. And those are things you would not generally just throw on a grill. And that's like barbecued foods or roast. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that like the heating time doesn't matter. It's the, the length of time and, you know, to Rising tenderize time. stuff. Yeah, Totally. Uh, how's the response been to your class so far? Really good. Like I, he, one of the things about being like a creator of things is you, you think you have a good idea, like you're pretty sure there's demand for it and then you make it and see what happens, um, <laughs> which is like very stressful. Um, it but is we terrifying. Have, oh my gosh. It's just like, please like this, please. I worked on it really hard. Um, but there's over 30 students in there now and gotten great feedback. Um, right now, what we're kind of, I'm not really, in, I'm trying to decide if um, 
a community is something we pair with this or not, because not really interested in a Facebook group necessarily. There's tons of sous vide Facebook groups already, but potentially might be interested in something more intimate, like a Slack channel. Um, and so that's some, that's something I survey uh, incoming students about. And um, we'll see if that's like the next iteration of this. Um, but one thing that I did to make this more approachable, which I, I got a lot of feedback on, um, was the price. So I initially sold for a week. Um, all it costs to join Subid School is $19. And that's not recurring. That's just one time $19. I add new content regularly. It's a pretty good deal. <laughs> um, and then I, after a week, I bumped it up to 27 And um, I would say I probably had 10 food blogger friends or entrepreneur friends reach out to me and be like, that's too cheap. What are you doing? And it's like, I totally hear you. But my, I, this is going to sound really like cheesy. I, I don't mean it to sound so cheesy, but my true goal with this was to get people who are intimidated by sous vide, give them the confidence, the confidence to actually do it. And I made my money back and I'm thrilled with that. And um, I just, I just want people to be as excited about sous vide as I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good way to approach is knowing who you're trying to reach and if you're trying to reach people that are scared of doing sous vide, like it's, in my opinion, it's hard to say like, well, if you just pay me like 200 bucks, I will make you comfortable with it. They're like, it's sitting in my closet. Like if I cared enough, I would have done the research <laughs> to figure this out. I'm not going to give you $200. So exactly. trying to move that price down is, you know, it's easy to learn sous vide. You give Crea $2,500 and you go there for three days and do hands-on cooking, you know, but not everyone yeah. wants to do that. Exactly. Yes. I wanted this to be like a really low risk thing. So like, even if they're thinking like, I know I should use this thing. Maybe if I take this thing, I'll get to it eventually or whatever, like, then that's fine. Then they can spend very little money and have this resource available to them when they're ready. And rumor has it, you might be working on another cookbook as well. I am. And uh, I haven't, even announced this to like my following or whatever, but I'll give you guys a little teaser. It's going to be um, meal prep related and sous vide. Um, nice. So I'm really excited about this kind of continuing on with the theme of reaching home cooks and empowering home cooks because I use sous vide heavily in my meal prep routine. Like sous vide chicken breasts happen in my kitchen constant. I literally have chicken breasts downstairs defrosting for me to throw in sous vide <laughs> and egg bites are a huge part of my routine and all these things. And like, um, my mom is actually the person who inspired me with this concept because her, like, I don't know, monthly routine is to go to Costco, buy a ton of meat. She just kind of gets what's on sale and what looks cool. And then she gets home and will put some in a marinade or season some of it or whatever, and like cut it up, package it, and throw it all in her freezer. And then she just does freezer to sous vide meals for her and my dad all the time. And it's so smart and so easy. And you can have this like really amazing meal in very little time. And I, I just, I really love it. <laughs> What's your go-to process for, you said you do like chicken breast. So for someone that doesn't do, I do a lot of sous vide meal prep. I love it too. But yeah. for someone listening that doesn't do it, what is, you know, so they have an idea of how you can kind of work sous vide into this meal prep kind of workflow. Yeah. So I, well, I actually, you know what, I'm talking to an audience that can relate to this. I have multiple immersion circulators. <laughs> I'm sure that you guys do too. And so usually I'll have a few different setups and the way I kind of think about it is I'll have like, um, a really hot bath going and a less hot bath going. And so really hot bath is mostly for my egg bites. Um, and then other egg, or, and then sometimes veggies if I'm doing sous vide veggies, but honestly, I don't do a lot of sous vide veggies. Um, and then the other one, I will do sous vide chicken breasts um, and sous vide chicken thighs, um, even a whole sous vide chicken, um, and essentially par cook. So chicken breasts, well, in the case of chicken breasts, I'll cook them, take them out. I usually don't even bother searing because usually if I'm doing sous vide chicken breasts, it's like to throw into fried rice or pasta or whatever. Um, and I dice them up and put them in a container. And then that's like literally ready for me to go to make super easy lunches throughout the week. And I can repurpose leftover rice or leftover black beans or whatever from our dinners. And then, um, for something like sous vide chicken thighs though, one thing I love to do is bone in skin on essentially par cook them with sous vide. And then throughout the week, if I want an easy dinner, all I have to do is like remove them from the fridge a half hour or so before we want to eat and sear them. And then it's done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then if you, one thing I haven't done, 
but I want to experiment with is doing that with steak, um, which there's in theory, no reason why that wouldn't be just fine. I just haven't done it yet. Cause usually I'll just pull it from the freezer and put it right in, but that's what my routine looks like. One of the, uh, one of the things that I really like is coming from my home cook background with no culinary training and then having gone through the sous vide, um, as, as much as I have, and then taking things like the Crea course and kind of learning the restaurant stuff. I love seeing the overlap that a lot of times in home cooks, we think like, well, how do you reheat it in the circulator? How do you, you know, redo this stuff? And in Crea, they teach you, like, if you have already cooked something for a restaurant service, you chill it down. And then like, maybe you just reheat it under the salamander. You just reheat it on the stove and you already know that it's perfectly cooked to the temp final temperature you want. So if you have a medium or a steak that's perfectly cooked and you reheat it by pan frying it, you don't have to get the middle to 130. If it's 110, 120, like it's it's already cooked through to where you want. And now it's going to be warm in the middle and people will love it. And it's been a great way to use meal prep for home cooking for me. I'll do ribs ahead of time for like a party, um, chill them down. And then the day of the party, I'll just throw them on the grill with some barbecue sauce and reheat them. And there's no sous vide involved in the reheating process, but I know they're perfectly cooked. They're nice and tenderized and they're ready to go. Yeah, that it's it, that part is like miraculous. I, I really hope that it becomes easier for rest. Well, and, and I'm not sure what the um, food safety regulations are like everywhere, but in Oregon, uh, it's hard to use sous vide. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I really hope that that changes because it is much safer. You know, for sure you are cooking food to a temperature that is safe. Um, and anyways, that's like another rant for another day, but I, um, worked in restaurants for a really long time. My early twenties were spent, um, as an assistant manager in restaurants. And, uh, I didn't know about sous vide at that time, but I can look back now and like, think about our processes in the kitchen and how much easier they would have been with the help of sous vide. It's amazing for home cooks and chefs alike. Especially the ability to cook to pasteurization is great for, you know, chefs and home cooks that you can cook your chicken breast, pasteurize it, and it's going to be fine in the fridge as long as you yep. chill it the right way for two or three weeks, like in the bag. It's great. It's amazing. And like, even like thinking about the money you could save um, with pasteurized egg yolks, because you could do that yourself in a restaurant for a Caesar salad. Um, or, you know, there's so many ways in which it would be incredible. And, uh, and the nice thing about the way it can make food safer too, from a home cook perspective, like um, one of my cousins is pregnant right now. And she can feel safer about eating a rare steak because she, or a medium rare steak, because she can pasteurize it. And so there's, yeah, it's, it's magical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patty um, Wiseman has a question. She says, what is the largest container I can use for one circulator? I don't want to crowd food, but I'm limited by my 19 quart La Pavie container. You know what? I truly don't know. The biggest I've ever pushed is a standard size cooler which I'm not sure um, what the volume of a standard cooler is. And then I have heard of people cooking in bathtubs, um, <laughs> but I would imagine that would probably be safer with two circulators, but I'm not sure. Do you know? Yeah. A lot of times it comes down to the circulator that each circulator has the different wattage and the different cir circulation power. Yes. And um, Dave from PolyScience was demoing the Hydro Pro Plus the other day. And he was talking about that, that there's is rated towards I think 40 quarts. And he was saying that's, um, he really likes that um, number because a lot of people say theirs does more. And he's like, I don't know if I believe them. He's like, ours does more, I think, but we don't say it does more. And other people claim it does more, but he thinks they do less. So for him, you just want to make sure that you can maintain that thermal mass of the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think if you're worried, throw in another circular. <laughs> like Yeah. If, I don't know. I have, I have, I think I have four immersion circulators though. And I, I don't know if I'm, that's the case for many other people. <laughs> yeah. And Patty said with the crowding, the food, that's one thing to always keep in mind is that when people ask how much food can I put in a specific container? My answer is always as enough that the water can still circulate around. As yeah. long as there's gaps between it, you're generally going to be fine. Yep. Yeah, that is, uh, I, when it, my go-to for like farmer's markets and events is to do individual cheesecakes. Um, and that was something I, I had to learn the hard way. <laughs> so yeah, leaving enough room for the water to move around. <laughs> what is the most amount of sous vide cheesecakes you've cooked at one time? Gosh, I've done, um, 60 before, but that was in two different containers. Um, and it was, it's not, oh gosh, it's not the quarter pint jars. It's one that was like a little bit smaller. 
Um, and yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so for the egg bites, do you cook them all ahead of time and then chill them in the fridge? Do you just make them ahead of time and cook them the day of? What's kind of your go-to method for that and for reheating them as someone yep. that might be interested in doing more sous vide egg bites? <laughs> Yeah, I cook them all at, on Sunday. And so I typically do six, um, although I'm a little annoyed my husband has started enjoying the egg bites too, so now I need to cook <laughs> more. Um, but uh, I cook them all at once and then pop up. I let them cool on the counter for like 20 minutes and then pop them in the fridge. And then to reheat them, I just reheat them in the microwave. So take the lid off. And then I usually lower the power of the microwave to like seven and do about a minute and 30 seconds and it's perfect. I'm not right. afraid of microwaves. So you could just reheat them um, and with your immersion circulator, if you wanted to, too, it would just take longer. It was funny. Um, <laughs> uh, some people talk about this, especially in the restaurant industry about that. They always think it's interesting listening to home cooks because home cooks are so like passionate about that. There's right ways to do things and right kitchen equipment. Um, and they're like, we don't get into a lot of those nuances in the restaurants. And one of those is microwaves. Um, AJ Schaller was on and she's like, and to people that say you can't reheat in the microwave, you should come by um, uh, uh, John Toller's kitchen that they just did like the entire menu for. And it's like half their things are reheated using the microwave. They're pre-cooked sous vide. They're reheated using the microwave. And yeah. it's like, it's amazing quality. So if you don't think you can microwave food, then you don't know what you're doing in the kitchen. Well, I mean, it's always really funny to me when people, there's a people, there's a lot of anti-microwave people. I am not one of those people we use because I, and I, but that's also kind of goes with the meal prepping routine. We, it's only my husband and I, we don't have kids. We love leftovers. So I typically cook big dinners with the intention that for lunches all week, we'll be having leftovers or for the next night's meal or whatever. So we are big fans of the microwave. <laughs> I always think that it's like, there's different things you're trying to accomplish at different meals. And if I'm yeah. trying to maximize the quality of the meal that I'm putting out, I'm probably not going to use a microwave for most things. But if yeah. I'm trying to eat lunch so I can get back to work and I don't want to spend an extra 10 minutes or five minutes, then the microwave is perfect for me. And it's going to be fine. Yes. And it, one thing I've actually loved. So um, my husband and I are high school sweethearts um, and I started loving cooking in college. So, he, which means I have a husband who can't cook anything <laughs> because I've cooked for both of us for forever. Um, but he like does cook with me in the kitchen and he'll like watch me cook dinner and all that stuff. Um, and now he'll ask questions. He's been home because he's a teacher, but obviously he's not in school right now. Um, and when he's like reheating a lunch, he's like, should I microwave this part? But like maybe do this part on the stove. And I'm like, yes, that is awesome. You so it's, it can be intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Michael Goldman says three of my five kids went to the I of I go ducks. I think he means U of O. <laughs> but, yes. I, was like, I figured he, he was missing some letters there. I was like, I assume it's the U of O, but I was like, yeah. I didn't want to correct it. And you're like, no, the I of I is one of the like, you know, I don't know. Something organizations or and organizations. Yes, go ducks. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm, that's how my blog started. A duck seven is like, college mascot type uh that's our college mascot and i was and still am a major football fan so yes go ducks <laughs> <laughs> and kevin uh, liddell says he worked in a, a station in a restaurant where all the service was finished in the microwave that's so interesting and I, well and, I, and it can get a bad rap like um i have heard which i don't know if this is actually true that uh olive garden is like all the meals come pre-prepped from somewhere and it's all reheated in the microwave, but I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, I feel like there's a lot of the new technologies get a bad rap because people misuse them or not misuse them. Like I want to say microwave TV dinners are necessarily misusing, but they use it to churn out food that isn't of the highest quality. And it's, uh, but when a lot of well. good things you can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. totally. You get the same thing with pressure cookers and even like, like the old, my, you know, braising isn't a good way to make food because my grandma used to braise for 20 hours and it was, you know, a dry hunk of meat by the end. Yes, totally. Actually, that's one thing I've been um, ranting out in my Instagram stories quite a bit lately is uh, like the just not trying to force a method onto a food where it's not exactly appropriate. Like, yes, I love sous vide. Does that mean I'm going to sous vide? I'm trying to think of like a good example. Like, I, this is very controversial. I don't want to like start a fight with anyone, but I am not sold on sous vide egg preparation, like for a poached egg or for 
hard boiled eggs. Like I think other methods are better. I do. And <laughs> I'm going to stick to those methods until someone can conv convince me otherwise. <laughs> I will not be the one convincing you because sous vide eggs are my nemesis. I can't, I cannot get them right. I can't figure them out. Every time I do them, it's just a disaster. Yeah. And I like have a very good method down for steaming eggs to get a harder soft boil. So I'm just going to keep doing that. Like, yeah. <laughs> but. yeah. And some foods, it depends what you're trying to do. Like I almost always pan fry shrimp because it's just easier that way. But if I'm doing like a shrimp cocktail, like, I almost always sous vide it because you get get that perfect, like very, very steamed, pure kind of flavor with no oil, no anything on it. Totally. I am 100% with you there. It just depends on what I'm looking for in the final result. I'll even do that. Okay. Well, I go back and forth on this with salmon because um, I'm good at cooking it and, you know, in other methods, I'm well, I'm well practiced enough. So if I do, don't have enough time or whatever, it's going to be fine. But sous vide is still my favorite for salmon. <laughs> what, how do you use sous vide for salmon? What's your kind of go-to? Because there's a wide range of what you can do with salmon. Yeah. So I like to do it really, really rare. Um, so I can finish it under the broiler usually. Um, so I am lucky enough to have grown up with a fisherman and hunter for a father um, to the Oh my gosh, I'm going to make people hate me, but I'm going to say this anyways, to the point where as a child, I would beg my mom to not serve salmon again. <laughs> <laughs> you disgust me. Because <laughs> my dad would just catch so much. I'm like, mom, salmon again? No. Um, but my favorite way that she prepared it when I was growing up was with like a thick layer of pesto, Parmesan cheese under the broiler. And it's so good. So I love to do, um, I think what I usually do is 119 degrees for 45 minutes. And then I kind of let it cool for a second on the counter, do the pesto parmesan topping and then stick it under the broiler. And that's like my favorite way to do it. Nice. Just long enough to kind of give that the center of that texture. And then you can just focus on the outside crust when you're finishing it off. Exactly. Yeah. I love the concept too, of like the par cooking or the cooking and letting the outside chill before you sear it. Cause it could a great way to extend your sears and add a lot more flavor at the end. Yep. Uh, and it, it, the wiggle, because like one thing I still haven't, I I eventually, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on the name? What is the, um, the Sears all? I'd love to experiment with the Sears all eventually. Um, but currently I typically, I just use cast iron for all of my searing. Um, we don't have the most outdoor space we have is a little tiny balcony and my smoker takes priority there. Our camping grill doesn't give us a really good sear. <laughs> Um, so I am cast iron all the way and, um, yeah, I, I love having, giving myself a little bit more wiggle room by cooling off my food just a little bit before searing. Um, I used the torch a decent amount. Um, I feel like it gives a good minor texture to it and gives good color, especially for like, yeah. like a poached fish or something, but it's, it definitely doesn't give you kind of that cast iron crust on like steak that's, or any of that. That's interesting to me because I've wondered that because I mean, I have a culinary torch, which I've used to like give color when I'm doing a photo shoot or something like that. Yeah. And it sure it changes the color, but it, the, it's not a great crusty sear, which I love. So, and I, I usually go all out. Like if I have enough forethought, I preheat my cast iron skillet in the oven. Um, so by the time I go to sear, it's like crazy hot and I have um, a grill press. And so I feel like I've got my searing method down, but yeah. <laughs> And uh, Chelsea and I were talking about uh, notifications on the computer earlier and how my dog is scared of them. So we have everything silenced. I also don't use my torch much anymore because our dog is also hates the noise of the torch. So he runs outside every time I, I torch food. So I've, I've been doing that less as well. That's so funny. I wonder, that is such an interesting noise to be afraid of. That's very Body. Yeah, he was fine the first like two years I had it, and then he was just suddenly decided, you know what, I don't like this anymore. And no, yeah, oh, he's a weird dog, but we love him. <laughs> he's he's a very handsome dog, so he's got that going for him. He's yeah, not, it makes up not for too it. high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about you doing a whole chicken. You demoed this at the last year's virtual sous vide summit. We have the other another one coming up in August. Um, looking forward to that, um, and what is your method for doing a whole chicken? Cause some people go back and forth, you know, especially for like whole Turkey, which is much bigger than a chicken, a little bit harder to do, but what's your method for doing a whole chicken? Yeah. So typically, um, like I've always found, like, it seems like often, um, at the grocery store or at Costco, there's a deal where it's like 
buy one chicken, get the other one half off. And I'm like, okay, fine. Like I'll do this. So what I usually do is smash cook the chicken, um, and then, uh, season it and freeze it. And then I'll usually just pull it out and go straight to the immersion circulator. So honestously, the hardest part of sous vide a whole chicken is fitting it in a bag, <laughs> 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 which I can do. Um, but the spatchcocking part is really important. Um, just so, so if anybody on here isn't familiar with spatchcocking, it's removing the backbone um, and then like essentially allowing the chicken to lay flat. So then you also break the breastbone. So it'll lay as flat as possible. And mm -hmm. for sous vide, that is, um, allows you to get a much more even cook with a lower cook time. So my favorite temperature for a sous vide whole chicken is 150 degrees. And I usually do about five hours. Um, and it's great every single time. Last week we did one and we finished it on the smoker and it was very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so and it's like such an easy way. I, I've also done it where I just finish it under the broiler um, or I'll refrigerate it and reheat it at like 450 degrees in my oven just to get that skin nice and crispy. And then you can save all those delicious um, bag juices and make a gravy. And it's so good. I love it. And at 150, do the bag juices, do you run into trouble with them kind of coagulating when you try to make a gravy? Uh, Absolutely. But I don't, I don't mind. I just reheat it and then cool. it's going to be okay. <laughs> I, I do that too, like especially for gravies. I'm like, well, that's why God invented immersion blenders is to break exactly. up the, the congealed then proteins. A little chicken stock too, and you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you aren't with them anymore, but Darren asked, um, do you have any insights on Vestas coming out with the biodegradable vacuum bags that you mentioned previously? Yes. So yes and no. So there are some actually available on the website right now but only a very low stock. So you can go get them if you want to. I actually have a case downstairs. Um, and there should be a more widely available stock, I think next month. Um, so stay tuned for that. I'm really, really excited about this because one of the biggest things we hear in opposition to sous vide cooking is the plastic waste, which I totally get. Um, and frankly, most reusable options kind of suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so and at least they're very annoying to clean in my opinion. Um, so I'm really, really excited about this. So these are, um, completely biodegradable. You can just throw them in with your compost. Like in Portland, we're lucky enough to have compost picked up with garbage every week. So we compost, um, very easily here. Um, but yeah, those are going to be super cool. Awesome. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is that you are helping the ISVA with the, um, you're on the inclusion committee and you're helping kind of, um, flesh that out, uh, grow the inclusion fund and a lot of the other things on that front. Can you talk a little bit about um, the inclusion committee and what's going on there? Yeah, so I was so excited when you guys asked me to be a part of the inclusion committee because it aligns really well with my approach to sous vide, which is I want everyone to do it. I'm just like very <laughs> excited about it. And um, it's something that I think previously has been um, not reserved for, but associated with uh, either really experienced home cooks um, or like, you know, um, geeks in the kitchen or whatever, and chefs. And um, as we've talked about during this podcast, I think it's a really powerful tool for home cooks um, and getting them to cook more things that are scary or hard or just make everything a little bit easier. Um, so on the include, what we're doing with the inclusion committee is attempting to bring everyone into the sous vide fold. So more women, um, more people of color, more home cooks who don't have a lot of professional training. We want everyone to sous vide. Um, so thinking, so a lot of like what I do is um, think about events that would be fun um, to bring more people in. Try and think of speakers and recruit speakers for demos that aren't, um, you know, your traditional speaker for sous vide. Um, and things like that. And then we're also working on um, fundraising. So, you know, when we can for, for lots of things, but one of the primary purposes of these funds that we're raising is when we can all meet in person again and, <laughs> and be together again, is helping cover the travel costs of some speakers. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about this. Yeah, we're, we're very excited to have you on board. It's something that Mike and I have been working on, you know, for trying to include everyone, even from a selfish standpoint, like we want people that cook different cuisines because it's, I love learning about all the cool stuff that's out there. Um, and the more people with the more different backgrounds and their culinary experience and just different upbringings, it's a great way to learn 
things that I didn't learn growing up in the you know Midwest um, America. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm with you there. Uh, and I think you know it, it's it, it can it can both be a blast to watch these like incredible chefs cook things that like you may never do yourself, but it's really fun to watch them cook, and then get these like tips that you're actually going to use in your kitchen for a home cook. So I, yeah. I think both of those things are really fun. Yeah. We've really enjoyed highlighting those in our sous vide showcases that we do every month because we had, you know, we have people that do very low, easy to make uh, recipes. We have people like I always pick on <laughs> my, on Mike, my co-founder, you know, but Mike Lashardi has no background in cooking. He's has no background being on videos. And I was like, Mike, you need to do a video for the showcases. You're the president of the ISVA. And he's like, no, I'm not qualified. I'm like, <laughs> we, we say anyone with a camera should be doing videos. He's like, okay, fine. I'll do one. And so he's, <laughs> He's out there doing stuff, never been on it. And then we have like Barry Tonkinson from, um, he's the culinary director at the Institute of Culinary Education. And it's like a 15 component dish. And like, here's how you peel the grapes so you can cut the scales to go on the fish mousse. And like, everyone's like, what in the, this is amazing. But it's, you get both sides of that. And I think it's great exploring all the different areas that sous vide can be used from the, you know, quick and dirty um, chicken breasts that are great for fast meal prep all the way up through these gourmet, incredible dishes. Yep. I am totally with you. It's been really fun to watch. And it, one of the funny things is too, and this should be said for anyone listening, um, is a lot of people get freaked out about doing a demo because it feels like this like big thing. And, but like you just said, if you've got a camera, you can do it. And it, it doesn't have to be super high production. We're just interested in learning how different people approach sous vide. Yeah, we're not uh, at the ISVA, you know, we aren't the food network, um, especially for our showcases. We're not, you know, putting on this like, here's the best way to do it, or here's this super high production quality. Our goal is to elevate the community and highlight members in the community. And members of the community have very different experiences in video production and in culinary background and in jobs. And we like highlighting everything. And it's Mike and I yell at even some of the people on our committee who, help with the isva that like do a video They're like i'm not sure if i'm ready for a video it's like dude you you have like you know thousands of instagram followers you may take beautiful photos you can do a video like yes. mike does one i do one i have no training like i've just done it a lot at this point yeah like i if you talk in your stories on instagram or anything you're more than qualified to do this <laughs> yeah uh so what type of um help are you looking for? Like, you know, part of the inclusion committee is bringing in more people to help with the committee to help with the different goals behind it. What type of um, roles, like if someone wants to help, what type of roles are out there? Um, and how can they contact you for more information about that? Yes, reach out to me because currently I'm a committee of one and I'd love yeah. to have some fellow committee members. <laughs> <laughs> so you can email me at Chelsea at a duck's oven. But um, what it is like essentially would look like is finding people who are willing to do demos, um, who are uh, people of color and women, um, or who we are looking to highlight here, and um, helping us to think of ways to fundraise, different different fun events to do, um, other things that we should be doing to be more inclusive, um, anything like that. So if you are, and uh, I mean, this isn't a huge time commitment either. Like I'd say I probably spend five hours a month on this. Um, so it doesn't have to be this big, scary thing that you're doing either. So, and then we can be friends and I can hang out with you and that would be great. <laughs> and then I get to learn more about great food. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. And, uh, this month's sous vide showcase is that's coming up. I think it's on the 27th. Mike can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but it is the, uh, it's on regional cuisine and it's going to serve as a big fundraiser for the inclusion fund. Kick that off. We have some amazing names coming on. We have Kevin and Carmen Koo are coming back on, uh, from kind of cooking. They're going to do a pork belly bow. Uh, we have Jerome Amos from, uh, BFAM cooking. He's doing a pulled pork with barbecue sauce. And we even have Simon Majumdar from the Food Network um, doing a sous vide Bengali chicken curry. <laughs> so it should be an awesome time. Um, you can sign up at the isva.net slash world of flavor. And we're going to have um, another five to seven speakers there doing some great demos. Um, we're putting together, uh, Chelsea's doing some great shirts for part of the fundraiser. I'm picking out mine already. And it should be a really good time learning some great food from different regions around the U S and around the world. Yeah. I'm super excited. And, uh, 
I, I think you guys are going to love these t-shirts. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I know. I love them. They look great. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're intimidated and you're just trying to get started, sign up for Chelsea's uh, sous vide school. You can find that at ducksoven.com slash sous vide school. Uh, you can email Chelsea uh, at chelsea at ducksoven.com and you can follow her on Instagram and check out her amazing vivid photography um, at a ducks oven. Uh, Chelsea, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise with us today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. It's always great uh, talking through everything and seeing what all the really cool stuff you're up to. I love having you on the show. Thank you. And thanks so much to everyone in the comments and that's listening right now. And remember, you can join us live every Thursday when we record these episodes. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. So join us Thursdays at afmeasy.com slash show or search for Exploring Sous Vide on your favorite podcast platform. This has been Exploring Sous Vide, where we're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. Till next time, I'm Jason Logston. See you all next Thursday. <laughs>